I am I am ready. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome to a special Christmas themed edition of uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's uh, live stream. Uh, in case you couldn't guess from our dress, this is all about Christmas in the Civil War. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the program today. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I'm joined today by Civil War Santa, AKA Brad Stone. Uh, thanks for being here, Brad. Well, ho, 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 it's great to be here and uh, to uh, talk to you, John, as always, and to all the folks out there. Yes, uh, and you know, with Brad doing the whole Civil War Santa deal, uh, you know, I couldn't drop the ball, so I had to up my Christmas game as well. And um, you certainly did, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the goal. Uh, well, thank you everyone for being uh, with us today. Um, if you have any questions throughout the program, uh, go ahead and drop them in the comment section. We're gonna do our best uh, to get to as many as we can um, over the course of the program. Uh, if you're new, um, we're glad you're with us today. Uh, consider liking the video, sharing the video, subscribing to our YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook. Those are the best ways, easy, free ways to support the museum and stay up to date with the very latest content that we're producing. If you wanna take your support to the next level and really support what we do, uh, we're actually doing a year-end fundraising campaign. All donations are tax deductible. Uh, we're trying to restore our uh, reproduction Civil War era ambulance. Uh, it's seen about a decade of use, kids climbing on and off it uh, and, and whatnot. And it just, it needs some work uh, in order for people to continue to enjoy it for years to come. So if you wanna step up your support and uh, help us out financially, uh, I'll post a link to that, uh, our campaign in the comments and you can help keep our ambulance rolling uh, as it were. Um, so uh, with all that said, uh, Brad is going to talk to us today about Christmas in the Civil War and the various ways in which that uh, uh, Civil War era Christmas kind of informs our modern holiday uh, that we still celebrate today. So um, with that, Brad, I'll go ahead and turn it on over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. If we could have the first slide, please. Um, we're I'm here to talk about what John just alluded to, the fact that the Civil War in many ways helped shape the modern American Christmas that we enjoy today. And um, I hope this isn't a, you know, typical boring um, history lecture. I want to make it an extraordinarily boring history le uh, lecture, just kidding there. But we're, we're going to have some fun with it. And um, to start out with, I think uh, many of us have the belief that, you know, the Christmas that we enjoy today really is just an extension of the Christmas that, you know, the pilgrims and other, you know, ancestors brought to the United States and that we've you know, expanded upon a bit. But basically, we just continue those traditions. Well, the reality is that isn't true. What what has happened is that a uniquely, you know, American form of the holiday has developed here. One that I think is far more complex and I, I think inspirational. And I think hopefully this talk will give everybody a better appreciation of the, how Christmas came to be and, and what a special holiday it is. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, to begin with, uh, our pilgrim forefathers and the Puritans really didn't think that highly of Christmas. In fact, um, they uh, disdained it. Uh, they uh, associated it with the Church of England, which, you know, they had fled uh, or trying to severely reform, um, or Catholicism. In, in fact, in um, places like Boston, uh, for decades, uh, celebrating Christmas was uh, illegal and you could be severely fined for doing it. Uh, now, there are other colonies in which uh, Christmas 
you know, was celebrated like the Jamestown colony, but not in kind of the reverential way we do today. In fact, uh, Captain John Smith in his diaries recorded that he had a lot of eggnog um, on Christmas uh, when he was in the colony. Uh, so he was full of the spirit, but not the kind of religious spirit we associate with the uh, holiday today. So next slide, please. So let's jump forward to see what things were like at the time of the American Revolution. Well, again, Christmas is not considered the type of major holiday we um, consider it to be today. Uh, in many colonies or in many segments of America or the American colonies, um, Christmas isn't really observed because again, it's associated with Britain. And uh, at that point, Britain is not too popular among many colonists. Uh, there are some colonists uh, who do celebrate it. George Washington is one of them before the revolution. But again, it's more of a kind of partying holiday, not a deeply you know, reverential uh, holiday. Uh, George Washington in his diaries records one instance where he uh, rents a camel to appear at uh, Mount Vernon which is you know, kind of an interesting way of celebrating the holiday. Um, but when the Revolutionary War comes, um, you know, to show that Washington isn't really that devout a participant in Christmas, he chooses Christmas Day to launch one of his most famous attacks. And that is his attack on the Hessian barracks in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and it's one of his most decisive victories. Now, a little bit about the Hessians. For you that aren't familiar with the Hessians, they were German mercenaries that were fighting on behalf of the British. And the Hessians, when they uh, came to America to fight for the British, brought a number of their traditions, um, one of which is that they had Christmas trees. They would have like um, pine or evergreen trees that they would hang snacks or other you know, foods from um, to celebrate the holiday. They also set up boughs and holly and that sort of thing. And, and the Hessians at Trenton did that in their barracks. Um, so they were surprised by the fact that the Americans attacked them on Christmas day. Now there have been some rumors or some you know, urban myths that have developed over the years that one of the reasons why the Hessians, you know, were defeated at that battle is that they had become rip-roaring drunk on Christmas Eve. That is not true. Um, they were bone tired. Uh, the weather conditions were, were terrible. But it is true that they were caught by surprise in part because they were attacked on Christmas Day. So we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, Hessians um, in a bit. But again, this, this battle and the fact that George Washington chose to conduct our Christmas Day, again, indicates that Christmas was not the kind of holiday or held in the same esteem that we do today. So next slide, please. So one might ask, well, gee, why didn't Americans embrace holiday, uh, the holiday of Christmas in the late 18th century or early 19th century? Well, you have to remember that at that time, uh, Christmas was celebrated in a far different way than we do today in Europe, and particularly in places like England. Um, one of the major ways that you would celebrate it was through kind of revelry, having, you know, parties. And often they were pretty well fueled by alcohol. Um, one of the big methods for celebrating the holidays is called mummering. Um, now, today we think of mummers as the guys that, you know, dance in the parade in, in, in you know, Philadelphia. But mummery in, in both um, England and Ireland and Scotland and other places in Europe was a far different kind of uh, practice. What it was is basically you would have people usually from lower socioeconomic backgrounds go to the homes of you know, more well-to-do families and they would entertain them by singing, 
dancing or gambling with them. And when they gambled with them, it was usually in a way that was, um, you know, cheating. Um, and what they expected in return was for the more prosperous family to provide them with things. It would either be food or it would be alcohol or it would be money. So if you look at some of the songs that we sing today that appear to be wholesome on the surface, you'll see what was going on with mummering. Um, so one of the songs that we all love to sing is We Wish You a Merry Christmas. But when you look at the lyrics carefully, you'll see what's going on here. It says, for we all like some figgy pudding, which is kind of bread pudding. We all like some figgy pudding. So bring it right here. We won't go until we get some. So when you look at the lyrics, it sounds less like a holiday greeting than sort of an extortion threat. And in many ways, um, mummery was kind of like a Halloween from hell. In fact, in um, uh, Newfoundland, Canada, the practice was outlawed because mummers were killing families. So it's no wonder that some Americans uh, in the late uh, 18th and early 19th century were a little wary about celebrating Christmas. It had some, some kind of creepy overtones in the old world. Next uh, slide, please. Well, in the early 19th century, two forces come together to really radically change people's perspective on Christmas. And one is the Second Great Awakening. Uh, this is a religious revivalist movement that sweeps all across America, uh, starting in the early 1800s. And it really revives people's interest in religion. It starts infusing religion into a lot of aspects of everyday life, including the major holidays and especially Christmas. Now, the other uh, major factor is the Industrial Revolution, which really starts to take off, particularly in the North. And for the first time, it's producing a lot of goods at affordable prices. And it provides another way of, you know, celebrating the Christmas holiday um, in a way that wasn't quite as possible before, and that is by exchanging gifts. You know, all of a sudden you could exchange gifts with other people, uh, a wide variety of gifts, and again, at affordable prices. So both of these, the spiritual change and this material change began to start changing attitudes towards the Christmas holiday and how you should celebrate it. Next slide, please. So by the early 1800s, the modern Christmas is beginning to emerge and some ground rules are being established for how you're supposed to celebrate it. And these are moving away from sort of the drunken debauchery of the old world to a more proper, dignified and reverential treatment of the holiday. So in 1819, one of the great American authors at the time, Washington Irving, writes a series of essays called The Sketchbook of Godfrey Crayon Gentlemen, which outlines how a proper family should be celebrating the Christmas holiday. Now, in 1822 comes Reverend Clement Clark Moore's very famous poem, A, Christmas, a Visit from St. Nicholas, which we know as Twas the Night Before Christmas. And this helps establish a whole bunch of things. Um, that uh, you know, make for the modern Christmas. One, it establishes a spirit of gift giving and goodwill and charity. And um, also the fact that the holidays should be focused on children. And you know, uh, that, that's what so the poem is about, that Santa Claus uh, comes down to deliver gifts for children. And it also, starts giving us some details about Santa Claus. He's a jolly guy. And has he transported by a flying reindeer? Now, um, John, I'm gonna give you a bit of a challenge. Can you name all eight of the reindeer? Oh boy, let's see here. Uh, Dasher, Prancer, Donner, Blitzen, 
Comet, Cupid, uh, uh, something, something. V Vixen? Did I say Vixen? Yeah, that's that's close enough. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> uh, Dasher, uh, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donder, and Blitzen. Uh, but you're close enough, so I'm gonna. Santa's gonna give you these reindeer nuggets. They're delicious treats. Don't ask how they're made, but they taste swell. So anyway, <laughs> um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second too. But anyway, yeah, this this twas the night before Christmas really goes a long way to establishing what Santa's gonna be all about. Now, the other major influence going into the middle of the uh, 19th century is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, uh, which again further pushes the idea that Christmas in Victorian England will be one which, you know, uh, celebrates charity, focuses on the children in the form of Tiny Tim. And that book is a blockbuster, as we would say today, in Victorian England. And in the middle of the 18th century, the general rule is if something becomes very popular in Victorian England, Americans will be swept up in that popularity as well. We take much of the lead in cultural things on what's going on in Victorian England. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So actually I lied, we're not gonna talk about it in this slide, but we'll talk about it in the next one. Um, okay, so, you know, we, by the, toward the middle of the, of the uh, century, 19th century, we have all this interest in celebrating Christmas. But one of the questions is, well, how do you celebrate it? Because there are a lot of influences from the old world, from Europe. First of all, what time of the year do you celebrate it? We have some places that celebrate it in early December. And then if you go to more Eastern parts of Europe, they're celebrating it in January. Also, do you celebrate on one day? Do you celebrate on 12 days? And who's the Santa Claus character going to be? Well, you got a wide range of influences here. You got Father Christmas in England. He's not much in terms of sort of spirituality. He's more of a party kind of guy. Then you have Pierre Noel in France, a bit more spiritual. Then you have Santa Claus in um, Holland and Belgium. He's, he's spiritual and he's great to the good boys and girls, but to the naughty boys and girls, he has an associate named Zabat Pete who basically kidnaps them and sends them down to Spain. And then similarly, in, in Germany and parts of Central Europe, you have St. Nicholas, again, a good spiritual guy who rewards the good boys and girls, but he has an associate named Krampus who does not so nice things to bad boys and girls. So again, you got a broad range of influences. So Americans have to kind of decide where they're going to you know, draw the most influence from. So the question is, is it going to be from a place like England, Ireland, Scotland? Well, the reality is it's none of the above. It's actually going to be Germany. And it's going to be Germany for a couple of reasons. One, external reasons, and one, internal reasons. So with the next slide, please. So the big German influence from abroad centers on this guy, Prince Albert of Coburg, Germany. Now, the reason why he's so influential is that he marries, you know, Queen Victoria. And by virtue of that, he's going to influence a lot of what goes on in Victorian England. And he, in effect, becomes sort of the Martha Stewart of Christmas there. And as she would say, that's a good thing. He introduces a lot of the customs of Germany, including things like the Christmas tree and ornaments for the Christmas tree and specially wrapped presents that are wrapped in special Christmas paper. And again, this overwhelming focus on gifts for the children, making the holiday a special time for children. Now, um, one of these traditions, as I mentioned before, is the Christmas tree. 
uh, which had been brought over by the Hessians, uh, wasn't picked up by Americans at the time, but when Amer um, the press in England starts doing these illustrations of what's going on in Queen Victoria's court, as you see here, it immediately causes a boom in Christmas tree sales in England. Almost every proper home in England all of a sudden gets a Christmas tree and the ornaments to hang from it. And when those pictures come across the pond from the United States, the same thing happens. Almost every American home, proper American home, wants a Christmas tree and wants ornaments. So, as I like to tell people, the Hessians may have lost the Battle of Trenton, but in a sense, they won the Bell of Christmas. Next slide, please. Now, just to give you a uh, idea of how influential uh, German is, Germany is in terms of our Christmas, at about the time that the Christmas tree and ornaments take off in both England and the United States, Germany develops a tremendous Christmas tree industry, uh, or I should say Christmas ornament industry. And they will export them all over the world, including to the United States. As a matter of fact, Germany will be the largest uh, producer of ornaments going to the United States until the brink of World War II. So that's how influential it is. Next, please. Now, the other part of the German influence comes from within the United States, because in the period leading up to the Civil War, there is a tremendous uh, influx of German immigrants into the United States. There are about 1.4 million Germans that come in during the you know, 20 years before the Civil War. That's second only to the Irish immigration. And it's not by much. And in a sense, the German uh, you know, immigrants coming into this country have a bit more influence than the Irish do because they tend to be uh, more skilled, a little bit more educated, and there already is a significant German presence in the United States that has developed since the inception of the country. So again, they're bringing in things like their uh, uh, traditions of the Christmas tree, how you celebrate the holiday, gathering of families, and again, this very strong focus on providing gifts to children, which many people attribute to the teachings of Martin Luther. Next, please. So on the eve of the Civil War, America is more and more adopting Christmas as a big major holiday. It's becoming you know, more and more of our culture. It's becoming more and more commercialized. Uh, we have things developed like Christmas cards and other Christmas related novelties. Toys be, start to become a major um, industry in the United States. Uh, again, it's you know, thought of as a very special day for children. And it's also becoming more and more part of the American um, publishing industry. There, you know, there are more advertisements during the Christmas season. There are more books and other things specially designed to celebrate Christmas. Now, I will get back a little bit to the, um, the um, Twas the Night Before Christmas when I asked you about the reindeer. Uh, just to show you how strong the German influence is, when we say the poem, uh, we say Donner and Blitzen, but that's not the way it was originally written. It was Dunder and Blitzen. And the reason for that is it was written originally to give those reindeer Dutch names. That's how it was intended. But by the time the poem got reproduced in a massive way, shortly before the Civil War, the German influence was so strong, they changed those two reindeer's names to kind of give them a more German um, uh, names. Uh, they went from uh, Dunder to Donner, and from Blitzen to Blitzen. So again, it shows this really tremendous influence the Germans are having on, you know, the American Christmas. Next, please. 
So I talked about the fact that it's becoming a more genteel, more kind of family friendly celebration. Yeah, by and large, that's true. There are still some outliers, though. And in some major cities, it's still kind of celebrated in a raucous way. You have drunken gangs running around. Some of them call themselves Calithumpians. But as the middle of the 18th century, or rather 19th century develops, this is becoming more and more of, um, or I should say less and less of a phenomenon. Um, again, Christmas is becoming gentrified and becoming more of a family-centric holiday. Next, please. So much so that by the eve of the Civil War in 1861, the vast majority of states have adopted Christmas as a legal holiday. Indeed, as, as it says, 29 out of the 34 states um, have made Christmas a legal holiday. But as all parts of the country more and more uniting around Christmas, uh, the country itself is getting more and more divided. And that is what's leading it to tear apart. And the question is, can Christmas do enough to unify the country to overcome that issue? And next slide. The answer is no. Um, for 4 million enslaved Americans, Christmas is a whole other reality. Um, you have um, very strange uh, scenes in Southern newspapers, for example, where they'll be running ads for Christmas, toys for children, that sort of thing. And they'll be right next to ads for enslaved people, including women and children. Um, a big problem for enslaved people at the, uh, at the Christmas time is that's a time when a lot of contracts for their labor are running up. So many of these families, uh, enslaved families, may be on lease to like a farm or, or a plantation by their owner. Well, when that contract comes up, he may decide to split them out, to send them to other places or to return them to his farm. And that's a prime time when enslaved families may get torn apart. Likewise, the end of the year is a time when tax, taxes are due. And again, if someone who owns enslaved people owes taxes, he may make the decision to sell you know, property or to sell them to somebody else. And again, their families may be torn apart. Now, some slaveholders make a big spectacle of the fact that they you know, treat their slaves to extra food or, you know, less work during the Christmas season. Uh, but for the most part, these are pretty hollow gestures. One of the most outrageous examples of someone who brags about this is uh, South Carolina Senator James Hammond, who brags that, you know, he treats his slaves well on Christmas. But the reality is he was renowned for for savagely, you know, treating them savagely um, throughout the rest of the year. So as people like Frederick Douglass will say, these minor gestures really have no meaning. And Christmas can do nothing to resolve the question of slavery and what's going to tear the country apart. So next slide, please. The Civil War begins. And almost immediately, both sides try to weaponize Christmas, you know, to say it, it supports its cause, their cause. And this kind of makes sense. Uh, both sides, you know, argue that God is on their side. So by extension, uh, Christmas and Santa Claus should be on their side as well. So you see uh, pro-secessionist publications like the Atlanta Chronicle declaring that, you know, the North hates Christmas and that the Confederacy is in fact a confederacy of Christmas states. Whereas the pro-union uh, Philadelphia Inquirer and other Northern publications say nonsense. Uh, Christmas is a fine old Yankee tradition and that the Confederates are the ones that are playing Scrooge. So this battle is going on and Christmas is gonna be part of it. Next slide, please. Now, fortunately for the North, they have a big ace up their sleeve and that's this guy. Um, Thomas Nast. 
Now, Thomas Nast is a German American immigrant. So again, he's gonna use those German uh, influences to uh, shape, help shape uh, Christmas in the way he thinks America should enjoy it. Uh, he is a war correspondent and a sketch artist and cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, which is the one of the premier uh, journals in America at the time, one of the most influential. And he is staunchly pro-abolition, he is pro-union, and he is a Republican and an admirer of Abraham Lincoln. So he's going to do everything he can to show that Christmas and Santa Claus are on the union side. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is how we do it. Um, this is Harper's Weekly, as they humbly call themselves, the Journal of Publication, of Civilization, rather. Um, and this is their January 1863 um, edition. And you can see on the cover, NAST has illustrated it. And this is widely regarded by many as the first major illustration showing Santa Claus. And this is how he depicts them. And I'm gonna get up so that you can show, you know, get a real sense of what he's showing Santa Claus to be. So hopefully you can hear me from here but basically what he is doing is he is wrapping Santa in the Union flag. My uh, jacket here has 34 stars, which represent the 34 states of the Union. And my pants, are, they, I hope you can see, are the stripes of that flag. So, He's wrapping, oh, he's oh, almost there, hold on. Yeah, here we go. So he's wrapping uh, Santa in the Union flag. As you can see, he has a Union flag in the background flying very prominently. Santa is surrounded by a lot of Union soldiers and they all are getting plenty of presents from Santa because they're good men. They're fighting on the right side. And uh, you can see some younger uh, members of the Union Army are getting toys and the reindeer in the background. So he's doing almost everything he can to really impress upon uh, the reader that Santa is a Union guy. But in case you don't get the point, I will point you to what Santa is holding in his hand. It's hard to see. But basically what Santa is entertaining the troops with is a toy. And the toy is Jefferson Davis hanging by a noose. Now, I think we'll all agree they don't make toys like that anymore. But anyway, it's a very clear statement by Nast of the fact that um, pardon me, Christmas and Santa are pro-union. Next slide. Now, NAST is doing other things during the war to help shape our appreciation of Christmas. And this is a very uh, famous and I think moving illustration of his called Christmas Eve. And what it's showing is that basically, you know, Christmas is a very special time of year when families should be together. But for the first time in American history, millions of American men have gone off to war and have left their families behind. So you see on the panel of the left, uh, the woman you know, at the window uh, praying, thinking about her husband who's far away at the battlefront. And in the background, you see her two children sleeping in their beds. Now, on the other side, you see the soldier who's far away from home thinking of the family he left behind. Um, and you see images below of armies on the march and um, you know, burial sites. Um, so, so it's a very moving um, illustration and it drives home the fact that again, Christmas should be a time when families are gathered around to, to celebrate this important holiday. Now, despite 
the very kind of deep uh, aspect of this illustration. He also wants to know you to know though that life should go on and it still should be a time for celebration for the children. So you will note in the upper left-hand corner, you will still see Santa and his reindeer on the roof delivering presents. Next, please. Now, as the war goes on, there's a growing disparity between what's happening at Christmas time in the North and in the South. Now, for the Union, it's increasingly a time of plenty and a time of abundance. So the ever-growing you know, industrial strength and economic might of the Union really takes off during the Civil War. Uh, and this allows uh, the Union both at home and on the battlefront to enjoy the holiday uh, in a bigger and bigger way. So uh, more presence at home, bigger celebrations there, and for the soldiers at the front, more gift packages from home, uh, more food rations, a wider variety of food rations. You even get delicacies like oysters, um, all sorts of new ways to celebrate Christmas for the Union. But in the South, it's a far different situation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as the North prospers, uh, the South increasingly experiences deprivation. Um, most of the war is fought on Southern territory. So more and more of its territory is being destroyed. It's farmlands, it's uh, limited uh, industrial uh, infrastructure. Uh, it also has to contend with the Union naval blockade, which is crippling its economy. So as the war goes on, there's less and less in the way of material ways of celebrating the Christmas holidays. Uh, again, both at home, on the home front, and on the battlefront. Um, increasingly, uh, Confederate families or Southern families cannot celebrate the uh, holiday by giving gifts, even to their children. And so Southern children are told that Santa is not going to show up. Uh, some are told that he's a Yankee, or some are told that he's been shot by Yankees. One particularly weird explanation comes from the Richmond Examiner. An editorial writer there says in, in this editorial that no real Santa existed, and that he was a Dutch toy monger and an immigrant from England who had nothing to do with real Virginia hospitality and Christmas merrymaking. Um, that's a really weird explanation, and I think he may have had a lot of cough syrup when he wrote it, but it gives you a flavor for just how increasingly in the South, they're trying to distance themselves from any celebration of the Christmas of the type that they had before the war. Next, please. Now, Lincoln and Nast are both trying to take advantage of the fact that union affluence and the ability to celebrate the holidays is a very powerful propaganda tool. And Lincoln, uh, it's interesting to note, when he was a uh, legislator in the Illinois state legislature, you know, many years before the Civil War, had actually voted against making Christmas a holiday, a state holiday. But as commander in chief of the Union Army, he does everything he can to promote Christmas. He uh, has lots of receptions at the White House. He, uh, he and his staff or cabinet uh, make a lot of visits to army camps and hospitals during the Christmas holidays. And he encourages people to celebrate the holiday in a big way, both at home and on the battlefront. Now, Nast picks up on this message, and he does this illustration called uh, a Union Christmas Dinner. And here he's kind of interweaving all those themes that Lincoln has been promoting. So here you see in the background this enormous, you know, Christmas, you know, banquet. Uh, the, the whole Union is seated around this, you know, incredible table and it's full of food and everybody's having a good time. 
And Lincoln steps away from the table and he opens the front door and who does he see there? A bunch of begra you know, uh, bedraggled uh, Confederate soldiers. They represent the Confederate States. And what he's doing is he's welcoming them back in. He says, basically, if you come back in, we'll welcome you with open arms and you can partake of this sumptuous banquet. So that's what the message is here. And again, Nass not being the subtlest guy in the world, tries to drive that home with these little illustrations on the side, which are showing Confederate armies surrendering and being welcomed back. And also pictures from the Bible um, up at the top showing sinners, uh, atoning for their sins, seeking forgiveness and receiving it. So, here again, it's a beautiful balance by Nast of the material and the spiritual. And again, he's driving home Lincoln's propaganda effort to use Christmas as a way of bolstering union morale and at the same time urging the South to come back into the fold. Next, please. Now, as the war develops, again, Christmas is more and more being used as a propaganda um, weapon for the North. And one of its greatest examples is, is when General Sherman, just before Christmas in 1864, culminates his march to the sea with the, the defeat of the port city of Savannah. He captures it. It's what one would consider or may consider to be one of the death knells of the Confederacy. And what does he do to um, announce it to the world and to Lincoln? He sends a telegraph saying, I beg to present you as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah. And what does Lincoln respond? He says, many, many thanks for your Christmas gift, the capture of Savannah. So by this time, you're starting to see a real merging of both Christmas and the American military. And this tradition will continue. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, there's an overwhelming sense that you know, Christmas and Santa Claus are kind of fusing themselves to the efforts of the US military. Next, please. So fortunately, the war ends and uh, Nass does this illustration to show that Christmas should be a time of celebration uh, about the end of the war and that a new holiday has emerged from the crucible of the Civil War. So you see this illustration, which says Merry Christmas to all, which is kind of a nice unifying message. At the top, the most prominent are the children, they're celebrating it. Below, you see families in celebration, people that have, may not have seen each other for years and now finally back together again, again, highlighting the importance of Christmas as a family time. And then finally below, you see a sort of stage set, a national stage set with the you know, reconciliation of the whole American family. Everyone is together, uh, it's a joyous time. At the center of it, you see Abraham, uh, pardon me, you see Ulysses S. Grant. Um, fortunately, Lincoln had died by this time, but now in Nass' mind, Grant is the great unifying force. So it's a time of goodwill, it's a time to be merry, um, it's a time for the family to come together. However, Nass being Nass, he has to get one final point in, and that is if you look carefully around Grant, you see the decapitated heads of um, leading Confederate figures. So uh, what I like to say is it's like all family reunions, there are some awkward moments. So next please. So in the years that follow the Civil War, Christmas will gain more prominence in America. And in 1870, uh, once, Union General Grant, now President Grant, will sign into law um, a, 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 a bill that will make Christmas, the 4th of July, New Year's Day, and Thanksgiving national holidays. And um, 
just to touch on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is another holiday that uh, Abraham Lincoln likes to promote during the Civil War, because again, it's a way that the uh, North can show that it has, you know, uh, bountiful food and, and, and people can really celebrate it and give thanks. Um, Jefferson Davis also promotes uh, Thanksgiving for the Confederates, but it's telling his way of celebrating it or not celebrating it, as the case may be, is to fast during Thanksgiving. So anyway, back to Christmas. Um, Christmas is created a national holiday. And it's done so in part because it's thought that it can reunite the North and the South around a common holiday that both had increasingly thought very important, um, both materially and spiritually. But it's also an important holiday for many because they think it will help assimilate another wave of immigrants that's coming into the United States. Indeed, during the Civil War, about 5.5 million people come to the United States. That's amazing when you think about we're having a civil war at the time, but still that many people are coming into the country. So yeah, Christmas is a way of reuniting the North and the South, but it's also a way of helping all these people become assimilated and become part of the American experience. Now, although uh, you know, Christmas is undoubtedly a Christian holiday, you know, uh, designed to celebrate the birth of Jesus, it is not created as a federal holiday for that purpose. Uh, in fact, uh, President Grant and others had defeated an effort around the same time to declare America a Christian nation. Instead, the point of the national holiday is to create a holiday which all Americans can um, observe in whatever way they want to. And of course, for those who are Christians in that way, but it, it has an all-inclusive character to it. Indeed, if you read accounts at the time, um, some accounts in you know, Philadelphia papers will talk about the fact that everybody is getting Christmas trees, including the uh, children of, of Israelites, which is their way of saying Jews. So it becomes a very popular holiday among everybody. Next, please. Now, Nast in the decades that will follow the Civil War will really try to do everything he can to establish almost every aspect of the modern American Christmas and Santa Claus that we you know, love today. Um, he um, takes the image of Santa Claus and he wants to make it uh, very similar to the leading figures of the time. And who, who are they? Are? Who are they? Uh, the titans of industries, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies. So now Santa is wearing a fine red suit, exquisitely trimmed. Um, Santa is has a very nice trimmed beard now. It's not the scraggly mess it was before. His hair is nicely coiffed. Um, and he's gone international. He has a uh, factory at the North Pole. He has workers, what we would call elves. Um, there's a Mrs. Claus. And perhaps most important of all, for this, inter, you know, he has an international distribution system, but what's behind all of it? He has a database, the book of who is naughty and nice. He could tell, you know, which category every child throughout the world falls. In. So he's, he's, again, a big time entrepreneur. Now, um, some, one of the things that drives me crazy is sometimes you'll hear people say the modern image of Santa Claus is developed by the Coca-Cola company through a series of ads in the 1930s. Uh, well, pardon my French, but that's balderdash. If you look at the NAST illustration on the left, which was done in the 1880s, you see that has every aspect of Santa Claus that you will find in the Coca-Cola ad from the 1930s on the right. Um, now, one thing I want to point out about the NAST illustration is you will see on his illustration, Santa has a sword hanging from his belt and he's carrying a knapsack. And that is kind of an allusion to something I'm about to talk about. Next slide. And that is NAST continuing um, point that Santa and Christmas should be part of 
the American military um, experience. And indeed it has been uh, from NAST on. You see Santa uh, going from left to right as an image in the First World War. In the Second World War, during the Cold War, that photograph was taken during the Berlin airlift. Um, you see Santa uh, as part of the Marine Corps Reserve's Toys for Tots program. And you also see him you know, in modern areas where our troops are deployed. So that very strong bond between Santa and the American military and patriotism and American goodwill continues to this very day. Next slide, please. And indeed, that's why Santa is, uh, or part of the military is dedicated to tracking Santa and making sure he's on okay during Christmas Eve. Um, and NORAD uh, tracks his whereabouts every Christmas Eve. Uh, that tradition got started in the 1950s when a local Sears store, local to where NORAD's located, ran an ad and apparently the number was very close to the number for NORAD and people started calling it, asking about Santa Claus. And so from that point on, NORAD decided to develop a way of letting people know that Santa was doing fine during his uh, Christmas Eve flight. Next, please. So um, the Civil War in many ways helped shape the modern American Christmas. First of all, it unified the observance of the holiday by transforming it into indeed a national holiday. It took many aspects of Christmas that came from different cultures and blended them into a uniquely American form of Christmas. And again, I think that NAST has a lot of uh, credit due to him for that. Um, and he, he shaped it both in terms of customs and images. Uh, it helps develop a Christmas that uniquely balances kind of the celebration of the spiritual and the material, as I talked about before. It promotes a Christmas with kind of an all-inclusive character, which means that Christians can enjoy it, as well as non-Christians. People from any way, any background can celebrate it in the ways that, you know, they enjoy. And it established um, America, I may sound a little chauvinistic here, but so be it, um, as an arbiter for uh, all things Christmas for much of the world. Next slide, please. But I have one last challenge for uh, John, and I think he's up to it. Um, there is one crucial aspect of the American Christmas and Santa that la uh, NAST left out. And can you guess what that might be, uh, John? And there's a clue on the screen. Does this have something to do with Rudolph? That is correct. Next slide. This guy here. Um, yeah, NAST uh, uh, didn't know about him. Uh, he comes about in the late 1930s. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, um, uh, store chain, which is uh, Marshall Fields, decides that they want to have an advertising campaign, and they go to one of their copywriters, uh, and he develops the character called Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer with the Red Nose, and uh, the campaign does pretty well for a couple of years, but. Then the company finally decides that, you know, they want to try something else. So they basically um, give back uh, Rudolph and the copyright to Rudolph to the copywriter. Uh, his name is John May. So what they didn't quite realize is that John May's brother-in-law is a guy by the name of Johnny Marks. And Johnny Marks is widely considered to be the most prolific Christmas songwriter in the United States. He's written more hits, uh, Rockin' Around the Christmas, uh, uh, pardon me, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, uh, Have a Holly Jolly Christmas, uh, you know, one hit after another. Well, when he finds out that his brother-in-law has the rights to it, he writes a little song called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's recorded by Gene Autry, who's a big singing star at the time, and they and other people covered the song 
And of course, it's a holiday staple now, and they made a ton of money out of it. Now, what's interesting about this is that both uh, Robert May and Johnny Marks are, are, are Jewish. But next slide, please. And if you look on the right, you'll see Johnny uh, Marks there, and he's with a gear. I don't think it's Rudolph, but you know they seem to be on good terms. Um, what's interesting is one of Johnny Marks's biggest hits is "I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day," which is recorded by Bing Crosby, again another big singing star at the time. And he wrote the melody for it, but the lyrics come from the Civil War. They come from a poem that's written by one of uh, America's greatest poets, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And the inspiration of it comes from the middle of the Civil War when his son, Charles Longfellow, is grievously wounded during the, during the war. And fortunately, he recovers. So even though the um, holiday has adapted over the decades, Still, in many, many ways, it always comes back to the Civil War. So I hope all of you have enjoyed this presentation. Again, I hope it's given you a deeper appreciation for the American Christmas and why, you know, it, it should be an inspiration to us all. Uh, here are my sources for it. And again, if anyone is interested um, in, you know, these or other sources, contact the museum or contact me. Uh, you know how to contact the museum. This is how you can contact me. So again, um, thank you for listening to this presentation. And I wish all of you the merriest of Christmas, Christmases and a happy new year. And uh, that certainly extends to you, John. However, I, I want to tell you that uh, Dave Price, the director of the museum, based on what all of you have said about him, is going to be receiving this. A big bag of gold. So, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> wonderful guy. Anyway, uh, so thank you very much. Oh well, that that was wonderful, Brad. Um, as always, uh, you know, incredibly informative, uh, well put together, and just a, a tad fun as well. Um, so that was uh, fantastic. And I, I have not been able to look through the the comments here uh, since I've been controlling the slides. Let me go through see if we got any. Any questions here? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, trainer Lori says, Brad, this is anything but boring. Already learned a lot. Washington's camel? Question mark exclamation mark. Uh, do you have any more details about that? <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, as far as I can tell, you know, um, the camel wasn't related to nativity scenes or anything like that. I, I, I guess. Um, the one thing that Washington and I have in common, he's, he's far better man than I, but we both had kind of a fascination with camels. So uh, the opportunity came up for him to rent a camel, so he did. Um, I rented a camel for my birthday uh, years ago. So again, that's one similarity we have. Um, a lot of uh, familiar friends, uh, Barbara, thanks Brad and John, Merry Christmas. Uh, a lot of folks really enjoyed the, uh, the program. Um, let's see. Um, well, I, I had a question, Brad. You're talking about the, the ways in which, uh, you know, Americans have drawn on other immigrants' kind of Christmas traditions. Um, the, um, shoot, now, now I forgot what it was. Something, something to the effect of the ways in which the... Uh, people immigrating to the United States uh, brought their own Christmas traditions with them and right. continued to celebrate them in their own way and they didn't become Americanized. Was that a, was that a thing that continued to happen? Yeah, and it, you know, like for example, I, I, I talked about the German influence and it's, it's enormous, but it's not celebrated identical to the way, identically to the way it's celebrated in Germany. We never adopted the um, Krampus aspect of the German Christmas, um, because again, um, by the early um, 19th century, uh, thanks to the work of um, 
of, of Dickens and other people, there was a very strong push against having Santa Claus be this kind of disciplinarian. Um, the, the, the whole emphasis was Santa gives gifts to children. Santa does not punish children. So yeah, I mean, I, throughout the presentation, I emphasize the fact that Germany had a very strong influence on the holiday, but it wasn't solely German. There were other um, aspects drawn from other cultures. Certainly, you know, the fact that it's a holiday that involves feasting and, and partying to a certain extent come from English traditions. Um, uh, the songs come from all over Europe, um, including, you know, France and Central Europe. So, no, uh, an American Christmas is truly a unique blend of all sorts of cultures. And probably in the decades to come, there'll be other aspects that will, will continue to refine it. But that's what makes it American. Uh, Holmes Davis asks, can this be found again on YouTube? Yes. Uh, once our, the live stream here is, is done, you can go back and watch this at your leisure, play and pause it and rewind and all that good stuff on the museum's YouTube channel. And eventually it'll make its way over to Facebook uh, as well, but you might have to wait a few days for that. Uh, Christy asked, um, what is, is Thomas Nast, uh, quote unquote, getting from his take slash spin on Santa? Is it merely just a drive to make uh, you know, the North seemed better than the South during the Civil War. What's, uh, can you speak a little bit more to his angle there, Brad? Yeah, he, um, as, as I alluded to before, he is very fervently pro-Union. Uh, he does not um, like the South. Indeed, one of his first illustrations, Christmas illustrations, a year before the one I show, show a Christmas tree where Confederates are hanging from the tree. So that gives you, he's, he's very intensely pro-union. Um, he is also uh, very strongly uh, pro-abolition. He, he is a, a foe of slavery. So I think, you know, patriotism is in large part what is driving him um, to his depictions of Christmas and in the Civil War. But also I think he is trying to promote the holiday as well and the importance of the holiday. And so that picture where, where the very sentimental one where he shows families apart um, is one that is, is trying to convey what is happening to America, what is happening to American families and how what should be a very joyous day is not because of the war. Gotcha. Um, Deb says, what a wonderful program. Christmas has not always been a pleasant time for me, but you have helped raise my spirits. And we're glad that we're able to do that today. And I think that's uh, a great, great point to end on here today. Um, thank you, Brad, so much for joining us today. Uh, I know I had a great time. I hope everyone out there watching had a great time. Did you have a good time, Brad? I had an extraordinarily good time. Uh, I'm glad that people enjoy it. And for all of you, those of you who uh, watched and enjoyed it, um, you're going to get what you want this Christmas. There you go. Um, so as we close, uh, if you enjoyed the video, uh, please uh, like the video, share the video, tell people about it, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, and like us on Facebook and across all social media, best way to support us for free and to show us that you enjoy the program. Uh, and if you want to take your support one step further, consider donating uh, in the spirit of giving to our, our year-end uh, fundraiser to keep our ambulance rolling. We have a, a Civil War era reproduction ambulance that we're trying to restore to its appearance. You can find links for that on our website, civilwarmed.org, uh, or in the, uh, the description of the video. Um, Again, thank you all for watching. Everyone have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.